and welcome to Something's Off with Andrew Heaton. I'm your host, Andrew Heaton. And if I'm ever radiated, a la Chernobyl or a Cormac McCarthy novel, I will find a way to make radiation elegant and natty. So here's how the story goes. We defeated the Nazis, go us, and thanks for nothing, Spain. But World War II raged on in the Pacific theater. And even though the Japanese war effort was clearly doomed, they just kept slugging it out, island after bloody island. And they would have kept dr doing so, drowning in an ocean of blood, were it not for President Truman dropping two nuclear weapons of such unfathomable destruction that they had no choice but to surrender. And despite the horrors of atomic warfare, it was still better than a longer, bloodier, conventional war. Now, we definitely shouldn't underestimate that Japanese psychological pressure to keep fighting. Even though the war ended in 1945, a soldier named Hiru Onoda maintained his post until 1974. He was so convinced of American villainy and duplicitousness that he didn't believe Japan had actually surrendered. And there were other soldiers who had been assured that capture by Americans meant horrible torture and death. He kept fighting for two decades after the war concluded. And he only surrendered when his commanding officer, who had long since retired, and was now an aging bookseller, personally flew to the Philippines, tracked him down to relieve him of duty. That's how freaked out he was. And there was another guy who lasted even longer. So if you consider that, that immense pressure to keep fighting the war, to not admit defeat, to not let the Americans in, you can understand President Truman thinking, if we went through with Operation Downfall, the planned invasion of Japan, that we could lose another 200,000 American troops, or, for that matter, over a million Japanese. So he made a tough choice. He dropped the first and only two nuclear bombs in history. But the chronology doesn't quite stack up, at least according to my guest, Ward Wilson, and I think I agree with him. Consider this. We dropped a nuclear weapon on Hiroshima on August 6th, the Japanese didn't surrender. At that time, 60%, 66% of their cities had already been obliterated. In response to Hiroshima, one of the top officials tried to summon their Supreme Council, and he couldn't even get them to meet about it, about a nuclear bomb. Then, on August 8th, two days later, the Soviet Union declares war on Japan. Uncle Joe and the Ruskies had not been in the Pacific Theater during the war. Now they wanted in. And that meant the entirety of Japan's unguarded back was wholly exposed to a massive foe, and they were screwed. At that point, after the Soviets declare war, the council meets to consider surrender. And then, while they're already deliberating, we drop a second nuclear bomb on Nagasaki. Now, in my mind, that makes our nuclear payload somewhat incidental to the entrance of the Soviet Union. And I have to admit, there's a part of my mind which recoils from this idea, and I think that it's rooted in guilt. Because if Truman wasn't truly justified in waging nuclear war, would that make him a monster? Would it make us monstrous? I don't think so. Keep in mind that when Truman spoke to his advisors about nuclear bombs, he was principally concerned that the radiation not come down as gas. And that sounds very weird, but keep in mind, he was a World War I veteran. To someone who saw trench warfare, nuclear weapons were just the newest and largest kind of bomb, not the most horrifying and inhumane kind of warfare that we now think of it. To them, that was gas warfare. No one had really contemplated the grim nature of nuclear war. And it's worth noting as well that when Truman left office, he spent the rest of his life trying to get rid of nuclear bombs. But it begs the question, if we've got the story wrong, about Truman and the surrender of Japan, what else might we have wrong about nukes? It's the subject of Five Myths About Nuclear Weapons by Ward Wilson, which we will discuss momentarily. But first, shake off the gravity of that conversation we just had, because we need to sell some stuff, which means it's time for a word from our sponsor. Something's Off with Andrew Heaton is brought to you by The Waterproof Guitar from Aquatic Acoustics. You're a protagonist in a rom-com. You're about three-fifths of the way through the film. At the beginning, you thought you had life sorted out. Everything was going great. You were due for a promotion at the big soulless corporation you work at. 
You had a vapid but smoking hot girlfriend and a sweet tie collection. But then, due to some wacky hijinks, you lost your job and your girlfriend left you. But as you picked yourself up and tried to rebuild your life, you realized that your carefree neighbor, who is a blonde and whimsical person, is actually who you'd been desperately craving the entire time. And you fell in love. But then you did something stupid and ran her off. And now's the part of the film where you make a big romantic gesture to win her back. And you're going to. Even though you're an uptight guy who would never do a big romantic gesture, you know that Kate loves guitar music. Specifically, she loves knocking on heaven's door. That's why, right now, you're standing in the middle of her front yard with a guitar. She flings open the window and looks down at you. Kate, I love you. I realized that I was just afraid of how much I loved you. But now that I know, I don't want to lose you. So you pull out your guitar and... There's a terrible thunderstorm. It's an absolute deluge, filling your guitar like a gourd. But you press on, and you play. Oh, that's awful, says Kate. Your terrible waterlogged guitar music is so horrible that I'm buying plane tickets to a new country. You know this is your one chance, so you play even harder. Oh no, there's another thunderstorm, with even more rain. Now there's normal rain, and also unrelated sideways rain. So much rain! But you're undeterred. You keep playing terrible guitar music. That's even worse, says Kate. I'm so angry about your soggy guitar that I'm going upstairs to have sex with Richard Gere, the other principal male interest in this film. Oh no, you hate Richard Gere. That really makes you mad. But you love Kate and you're gonna win her back, damn it. Oh no, the sprinklers just turned on. Now you've got the thunderstorm, the sideways thunderstorm, and the sprinklers. But you press on playing your guitar. That's absolutely 100% terrible, screams Kate. I am so enraged by your sopping wet guitar music that I'm texting Hugh Grant to come over and we're gonna have a three-way. I'm going to have spite sex with him and Richard Gere because that's how much I hate your terrible guitar music. Well, this isn't going according to plan at all. Time to get out your lucky guitar pick. That ought to do it. Wait, don't call Richard Gere. Don't call Hugh Grant. Tell Gere to wait in the car. All of a sudden, the fire department comes roaring down the street. They park in front of Kate's house, attach a fire hose to the hydrant, and then point it directly at you. Why are you aiming a fire hose at me, you shout. We got a report of a fire. There's clearly no fire, you shout. We're in a rainstorm. Ab says there's a fire, shouts the Alpha Fireman. Can't question the app. We are really in trouble now. So you switch hands. If you can't win Kate back playing guitar southpaw, you're out of luck. Oh, that's the worst, screams Kate. Your wretched music has filled me with so much rage that I just hacked Richard Gere and Hugh Grant to death with a butcher knife. Your butcher knife with your fingerprints all over it. You're going to prison forever. Guess you should have bought a waterproof guitar when you had the chance. The waterproof guitar from Aquatic Acoustics is the leading guitar for rhapsodizing in rainstorms, showers, and sprinkler systems. It sounds great dry, it sounds better wet. Hear a guitar like God intended, soaking wet on somebody's lawn. The waterproof guitar from Aquatic Acoustics. Play yourself a moist melody. My guest today is Ward Wilson. He is the author of Five Myths About Nuclear Weapons. Thank you for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry there's nothing funny about nuclear war, but <laughs> we'll do the best we can. Yeah, well, I don't know. Like, Did you see Dr. Strangelove? I feel like they did a pretty good job. <laughs> I have to tell you that every Twitter war on uh, on Twitter always ends with a quote from Dr. Strangelove. That's... Whenever people disagree, then that's always the last word, so... I, I picked the wrong field because I feel like Godwin's law dominates politics to where everything eventually boils down to Hitler. And if you're working in a strain of thought where everything boils down to Dr. Strangelove, you are, you're weirdly in a more fun policy realm than I am. Okay. Well, 
I rarely hear nuclear weapons described as fun, so I appreciate that. Yeah, no, they're terrifying. I'm, I'm horrified by them. Uh, but yeah. but I, I will say, I, I enjoyed your book. It really made me rethink things. I, I kicked up the uh, kicked off the program with, with kind of going through what, what I saw as the biggest mind bender in the book, which is that uh, you, you hypothesized that ultimately nuclear weapons were not what ended World War II. Yeah, it's it's um, and I think I'm a little like you. I you like history. And oh, yeah. what got me into this was uh, history. I um, was started to think about nuclear weapons and started to think about how to work on them. And the thing that made sense to me was to go back and check the facts. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. It's just a historian's urge. Yeah. So. I started going back and looking over all these events from the Cold War and so on, and eventually landed on Hiroshima. And uh, I was surprised that things didn't really seem to make sense. You know, you read a story, but kind of the facts don't line up right. Yeah. And so I ended up doing some work, and I thought you summed up the timing thing pretty well. I mean, there's, there's real questions about if you – um, if you look at the, if you look at it from Japan's leaders stand in their shoes, and look at the events of that last week of the war, it's really hard to make the bomb be the cause of them surrendering. Mm. Well, because they, they'd already been. I mean, as I said, they a statistic from your book is that sixty percent, sixty six percent of Japan's cities had already been blown apart. Um, so, yeah. so I, I don't, I, I can. We now have such a uh, a horrible, horrible fear of nuclear weapons, justifiably, that, that if, if a nuke went off anywhere, it would be a very big deal. But the very first time it happens, I'm not sure that that would actually register the same way. I, I think that they would be looking at in terms of, OK, did it affect our, our industrial capacity to crank out bullets and guns? Uh, is our supply line OK? You know, what was the because because a, a point that you make in the book is that generally people running wars are concerned about prosecuting the war. That's the thing that ends it, is whether or not they've got an yeah. army, not whether or not they've got yeah. cities. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, citizens are literally bystanders in war. And, you know, you think about the OK Corral, it wasn't the side that shot the most bystanders that won the shootout. It was the side that <laughs> shot the most gunslingers. So yeah. you're, you know, the point is to to do something that's militarily effective, not necessarily to, you know, blow up women and children. So, yeah, they, I, I'm sure that it, in some ways it, in some ways it's a naive proposition to say that Japan's leaders must have been shocked because um, no war leaders are ever shocked by civilian deaths. And there's some examples that like Churchill did not surrender when London was bombed or Coventry was flattened. Uh, Hitler didn't throw in the towel when Hamburg was burned to a crisp and Dresden was blown up. Uh, Stalin let a million people starve in Leningrad when it was surrounded by German troops. And the, the kicker is Chiang Kai-shek, who in June of 38, um, the Japanese are making rapid headway and he needs some way to slow them down so he can regroup the Chinese forces. He uh, blows the dams. Uh, in the Yellow River, and uh, it works. The Japanese are slowed down, but um, 500,000 Chinese civilians drown in the subsequent flooding. And so here's a war leader who killed uh, half a million of his own people when there was some, when he felt there was a justifiable military and strategic end in view. So, well, now that I am. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So, no, that, that said, one, one of the data points that I don't think is as clear in the book, uh, and I, I want your perspective on this, because I, I think the chronology matches up very well. I mean, like, the, the fact that they were already deliberating whether or not to surrender before the second nuclear bomb was dropped really raises yeah. questions on how much that nuclear bomb actually did anything. Um, yeah. That said, though, why, why wouldn't the Japanese military go, okay, look, we have to throw in the towel, the Soviets are invading? Um, why would they? Why would they need to use nuclear weapons as a pretext? Ah, well, um, the Japanese military were raised in the ethos of bushido. They um, uh, a warrior's code, and they took that very seriously. The war minister Anami Karachika kills himself, mm -hmm. uh, commits harikari, or however you say it, um, stabs himself in the stomach with a knife. 
mm-hmm. um, two, three days after they surrender because he takes his oath of loyalty to the emperor very seriously and his duty as a Japanese soldier never to surrender. So um, they're, uh, you know, they're, they, the, the, the problem that Japan's, a bunch of people, mostly civilians in the government, knew that Japan had to surrender. Their Navy had been sunk. Their planes were confined mostly to port because they didn't have enough fuel to fly them. Um, They were, they, they were being, uh, they were losing Island after Island after Island and territory on the mainland. And so they knew they were whipped. The military refused to surrender partly because Japan has this military tradition of pulling it out at the last second in the war they fought with the Russians, the Sino, the Russo-Japanese War. Yeah. The J- Japanese basically lost all the battles. But at the last minute, they won a big naval battle uh, and won the war. Mm. And, so, and the same with an invasion by the Mongols in the, I don't know, 1300s or something. Uh, a giant storm comes and blows all the Mongol ships at the last minute as they're coming to invade, blows them on the rocks, and they sink, and the Japanese survive. Uh, interestingly, the name of that wind that blew the Mongol ships onto the rocks was um, kamikaze. Oh, wow. Okay. So if you commit to go and fly your plane into American ships, it's because you want to be part of the divine wind that will save Japan. So they have this tradition of, you know, they can pull it out at the last second. They don't need to surrender. They need to hold on, hold on. Mm. And so it's very hard inside the Japanese government to get the Japanese military leaders to agree to surrender. Partly also because they'll have to admit they did a bad job. It's their fault if they lose. And then the bomb lands, and suddenly you could say, well, and people do actually inside the government. They say what we need to do is to say this wasn't a military loss. This was a scientific loss. The Americans made an an enormous scientific breakthrough that no one could have predicted, and so it's not our fault that we lost the war. So in a lot of ways, the bomb is the perfect excuse for losing the war. Okay. Um Okay. Yeah, I, I followed that. That makes sense, and I and I would assume that part of their part of their thinking as well, in terms of just holding out as long as they could, is they're watching as the war is going on, uh, former German allies being ha- hanged in Nuremberg, or at least on trial in Nuremberg, and, and they're they're right. probably hoping that if they can just make it as bloody as possible, that it will at least be a conditional surrender, and they'll get to hold right. on to Manchuria or whatever the holdings were. Uh, but yeah. but uh, but once once the Soviets invade, that's that's no longer a feasible um, scenario. Well, think about it. The Soviets bring 1.5 million men into the conflict. At, in the end of 1945, the Soviet land army was the largest land army in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people who object and say, well, the Japanese – and they've got to – I mean, the the Soviets invade the, on Sakhalin Island, which is the island just north of the northernmost island in Japan today – and the strait between those two islands is only 21 miles wide. So you know that as soon as the Soviets take Sakhalin Island, they're going to be invading Japan itself. Mm-hmm. Some people object and say, well, but the Soviets didn't have the landing craft. But the Japanese don't know that. Mm-hmm. All they know is that a major power has come into the war. They've got millions of guys. They've got you know a huge superiority in tanks and planes. And, and um, their choice is, do we want to surrender to the Soviets who don't believe in religion and will force us to give up our emperor mm-hmm. and our way of life? Or potentially we could sur- surrender to these Americans who seem nicer and kind of liberal and maybe they'll let us keep the emperor. And so that get, tends to be is a much, much easier choice when you think about it that way. Sure. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I would uh, if I were Japan. I would rather surrender to the United States under those scenarios than, than to the yeah. Soviet Union. So yeah. you, you you bring up that there's a couple of um, that you know a, a scenario people people mention to to um, disagree with your historical analysis. I, I'm curious because you've the, your book made a, a splash with with um, IR communities and with uh, nuclear nonproliferation communities in Washington and various things like that. It's been out, I think, about five years. 
Um, so mm -hmm. there's been time for people to react to it. What's the best critique of your book that you've encountered that, that actually kind of made you, if, if it gave you pause, um, you, you went, uh, okay, maybe that one. Um, uh... <laughs> they were all paltry in their, in their attempt to, to dethrone your thesis. Fair enough. I, I wink well, that at you. But if, 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 one, if one comes up, let me know, because I'm curious. Um, no, I mean, I guess the strongest counter argument would be um, that, you know, the emperor said that's why they surrendered. And so it must be so. Okay. And and the the Japanese higher ups are relatively consistent after the war. They do these post war interviews, with U.S. intelligence, uh, which is fascinating stuff to read. And and they're pretty consistent in saying, yeah, it was it was the bomb that forced us to end the war. Except, you know, once the emperor has said something, saying something else would be basically disloyal to the emperor and in Japanese, particularly in the Japanese military, they'd been raised that the emperor was half human, half God. Hmm. And so it's, you know, what he says kind of people line up behind. So, what, so once, once that narrative has been issued from the top, it becomes the dominant narrative despite any pre-existing other stories, which might've been proliferating at the time. Yeah. And what's interesting is to compare that with, actual meeting notes, actual diary notes and stuff, because um, they tell a different story. Hmm. Once once the emperor says it was the bomb, then everybody pretty much falls in line, and, and not everyone, but most people. Okay. So. Well, let's let's step away from Japan for a minute, although I, I think that's a fascinating part of your book, and it, and it did make me uh, rethink how I, I look at the end of World War II. Um, and we'll, we'll jump ahead to Soviet and American relations, because uh, the, the fourth chapter in your book, Nuclear weapons keep us safe. Um, I believe it's in that chapter where you detail at least three different instances where we've come so close to the brink of nuclear warfare. Uh, and I, I read those and went, oh, and those are just the ones we know about. I assume there's other stuff that we don't know about. Uh, but yeah. uh, ba based on what we know uh, or that's publicly available, what are situations which we almost got under the war? I mean, obviously, there's a Cuban Missile Crisis, but, but there were other things right. that I had never read uh, uh, prior to your book. Uh, let's see. Well, um, there was uh, obviously tension over Berlin in 61. Mm -hmm. There was a nuclear threat during the Kuomoi Matsu Taiwan Straits crisis. Um, uh, there were nuclear threats during the uh, Middle East War in 1973. Uh, um, wait, you know, is, that, is that the one between Israel, Syria and Egypt? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. And um, some some subsequent stuff, uh, the Able Archer, uh, the Russians uh, at one time thought that we an exercise that we were doing was a preparation for a nuclear attack. And then there's actually a movie called The Man Who Saved the World. Oh, I thought you were going to about... say war games, but, <laughs> but, but go ahead, please, please, with, with a better example. <laughs> The Man Who Saved the World is about a, a lieutenant colonel who was on duty one night in the newly revamped, um, you know, big room in Russia where they check all the sensors to see if there's a nuclear attack on the way. And the alarms went off not once, not twice, not three times, but five times that there was an incoming missile from the U.S. Mm -hmm. And... Um, this guy who just recently died. Stanislav Petrov. Um, that's the guy. Who, who I, I believe there should be multiple statues of him across the planet because he might have <laughs> saved the entire species. And he's, he's not a household name, but he should be. Well, and the Russians fired him, of course, right. because <laughs> he, he was right. Because he, yeah, he, uh, he did disobey an order to, to begin World War III. That was the protocol. <laughs> he didn't do it. So, you, you know, discipline's discipline, even if we, we yeah. exist as a result of it. <laughs> Well, there, well and, and, and there's there's nothing a bureaucracy hates worse than to have some smart aleck be a, be right. Yeah, you know. Well, I I, I found um that that story I think is is terrifying. The, the ones that really scare me, like I look back, you know, I, I wasn't around for the Cuban Missile Crisis, so I don't know what that was like. But it, but it at least is this bizarre situation where this sounds so weird. It's at least a situation where everyone is consciously thinking about what's happening, 
Um, yeah. It's, it's you know, uh, uh, JFK and his war room are, are debating, you know, whether or not we, we fire or if we get fired at, whether we shoot back. Um, and and we're, we're kind of getting into the realm of mutually, or we are in the realm of mutually assured destruction. The stuff that scares me uh, are the inadvertent near misses, where like at, at one point, um, you, you mentioned in the book that a, a bomber, one of our bombers, no, I think it was a spy plane, went off course by like 300 miles. Okay, so, and, so and, this uh, is Saturday, Saturday, October 27th, 1962. It's the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Everybody is on hair trigger alert. Mm -hmm. Everyone's nervous. Everyone is afraid that, you know, this is their last 30 minutes on Earth. And the Russians have been planning a nuclear weapons test. So they go ahead and test a nuclear weapon. We send a U-2 spy plane over the North Pole to do air samples mm -hmm. to get to track the radiation, find out about the bomb and so on. And this poor guy is flying along and his um, guidance system malfunctions. He's, and, you know, you're flying in the top of the world. There's ice down below and stars up above. How do you know where you are? Mm -hmm. And so he flies off course. Yeah, for, for the record, I can't get through Dallas without a GPS system now. So if I were <laughs> if I were piloting a spy plane above the North Pole, I'm fairly confident I would not be able to find my location. He, he, he flies 300 miles inside the Soviet Union. And he's looking down, he can see there's some landmarks and stuff as he gets over the Soviet Union. It doesn't look familiar. Yeah, this is not Mount Rushmore. He's smart enough to figure out from the stars that he is not headed in the right direction, which is really impressive. And so he sends a distress call out and turns west because he knows he must be, you know, the, the, the U.S. must be, I mean, he turns east. Mm -hmm. The U.S. must be to the east. The Russians have seen him on radar, and they scramble two MiGs to go shoot him down. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, in, uh, in Alaska, the American command center, they see that he's off course and they scramble two fighters to go and find him and protect him. But those F-102s that they send out, the two, the two jet fighters, because it's DEFCON 2, which is one level below nuclear war, in 1962, the protocol in the Air Force was that all of the standard missiles – the conventional missiles on, on all the fighters were removed and replaced with nuclear missiles. So these two jet fighters are roaring towards Soviet airspace, looking for trouble, and all they have as weapons on board are nuclear missiles. If they find those MiGs and they tangle and shoot at each other, there's a nuclear explosion over Russia and almost certainly a nuclear war. And... Kennedy's defense secretary, Bob McNamara, after the after the crisis is over, in fact, it's a, a movie interview he did, I don't know, 20 years ago, says the only reason we survived the Cuban Missile Crisis was luck. Because on that day, those two groups of fighters didn't find each other. And, you know, my fate, your fate. The fate of American civilization was decided by chance. And that's pretty sobering to think about. It, it is, but I think the, the silver lining there is that we were also saved by a guy with an astronomy major. Uh, or at least, at least some idea of what's like if you've ever been like if there's if there's some kid listening to this that's like kind of dorky and he hangs out at the planetarium you might save mankind from nuclear apocalypse right. someday based on right. understanding how an astrolab works. You better you better study your stars. If you're going to, yeah. you know, well, you, you, yeah. you had that example. You also had um, I, I think it was during the Cuban Missile Crisis or right. Bef maybe it was a couple of days before the Cuban Missile Crisis. Kennedy was trying to flush out Soviet submarines in, mm -hmm. uh, in the yeah, Gulf yeah. and he was dropping non-lethal depth charges. But as a result, he, he's trying to force them up. But as, this one submarine goes down. And so it's going under for two or three days. And I think the last thing they saw was, you know, Kennedy very nervously talking about how they needed to get all the nukes out of Cuba at the beginning of the crisis, and then they're, they're going underwater, and there's this literal um, crimson tide scenario unfolding in this uh, submarine beneath the waves where the captain and his exo were debating whether or not to surface and nuke Tampa or whatever the plan well, would have been. It, it's, it's, it's hot. The submarine has malfunctioned. They haven't been able to get to the surface because the U.S. Navy has been dogging them for days. And so they haven't had radio contact with Moscow. They don't know if a war has started. They have, I think, a 10 kiloton nuclear um, 
um, de- uh, torpedo on board. And the captain, he's fed up. He's angry. He's, you know, they're, the Americans are dropping um, not real depth charges, but test depth charges. Mm-hmm. And they very carefully told the Soviets, that's what we're going to do. If we encounter any Russian submarines, we won't harm them. We'll drop these things that bang like a, a depth charge, but don't actually have a, a punch like a depth charge. They're just noisemakers, mm-hmm. essentially. And um, But no one in Moscow told anyone who was in the submarines out in the Caribbean. So these Soviet sailors think they're being depth charged and he's furious. And he says, I'm going to, we will show the U S Navy that we're not, we may die. And they certainly would have with a 10 kiloton underwater explosion from a torpedo. They would have, the the submarine would have been destroyed. Yeah. I I would think if you activate a nuke inside of your submarine, that there's not a lot of pieces left afterwards. Yeah. He says, we may die. But we'll show those Americans that we're not afraid of them before we go, or whatever in Russian he said. Mm -hmm. And it's only because they had a rule that three officers had to agree, and the third officer refused to let them fire the torpedo, that um, we didn't have a nuclear explosion in the Caribbean and, you know, nuclear war. And I I can't confirm this, but I bet that third guy knew a lot about astronomy. I'm going to double down on that. (laughs) I think astronomy <laughs> saved mankind multiple times. So all the astronomy majors out there, they need to stand up with a little pride. Yeah, in their step. exactly. I mean, that, you know, Thanks. Yeah. Well, so so we we've established that um, there there have been several near misses, and I th- I think we we don't have to go into it, but I think at one point we accidentally dropped a, a, a nuke that was not activated clearly on like North Carolina, but had it gone yeah. off, there's a, a there's an mm-hmm. excellent chance we would have assumed it was Soviet, not our own tomfoolery that resulted Four. in it. Four of the five safety measures failed. Ugh. Ugh. The fifth one managed to not break. But yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So assuming that um, we'll we'll set we'll set the the oh no something went wrong stuff uh, aside for a moment, which I do find terrifying, and that's the stuff that terrifies me is that a flock of geese will be mistaken as an incoming missile or something. But <laughs> if we if we set that aside for a second, uh, when you get into IR theory, you get into to, uh, realism and things like that. There is a very big school of thought uh, that believes in mutually assured destruction and the idea that. Uh, because atomic warfare is so um, devastating in its totality that it's actually stopped World War III from ever occurring and that we are weirdly more peaceful because of it. Do you, do you subscribe to that? No, for two reasons. First, um, history has periods of peace. During Before World War I, there was almost 100 years of pretty consistent peace. There were some small wars, but nothing that lasted for very long, no um, large scale conflicts. And so there are just some times when you have peace. Actually, three things. Wait, the hold, thing hold is, on. I, I just, the, the hundred years before World War One. I, I mean, they're not, they're not world wars going on, but there's tons of wars between, be, be, before World War One for the hundred mm-hmm. years, right? Well, the, the Europeans themselves talked about how wars were getting shorter, fewer guys were dying, and in 1911, there's an article in the Encyclopedia Britannica where a guy says, there's going to be peace forever mm-hmm. out into the future. We'll never have to fight another war like that again. You know, Francis Fukuyama's when, grandfather. Right. <laughs> there are just periods when, you know, there's peace. Okay. So, um, so that's one thing. The other thing is, um, it is... Uh, um, so-called realists. And let me make this distinction. So there, there's a, I don't know if you're listening, I'm sure every single one of your listeners is smart and knows that there is something called international relations yeah. and that there's theory and that there's a thing, a school of thought called the realist thought mm-hmm. of, of international relations, um, partly started and promulgated by um, a guy at the University of Chicago. Um, but, uh, John Mearsheimer, that's not what I'm talking about. When I say I'm a realist, okay. and I do, and I, I feel a little like an intellectual orphan because, you know, I think nuclear weapons are a bad deal and we should probably get rid of them, mm-hmm. which makes all the peace people happy. But I don't really <laughs> feel at home with the peace people. I'm really kind of a guy who wants to check the facts and who understands that there's, 
you know, bad people in the world and you need to be careful. And I'm, you know, suspicious of human nature and, and all that stuff. So when I say realism, I mean kind of common sense realism. Yeah, you mean so, like pragmatism, l lowercase r realism. Yeah. Okay. So the problem with this idea that, you know, no rational person would ever launch a nuclear war, it's absolutely true. I mean, that, that is an absolute no rational person would ever launch a nuclear war. The problem is, I mean, it would be much more reassuring if we could ever find a purely rational person. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, what if we uh, I don't know, elected a sociopath <laughs> at some point in history? Or if, I don't know, the Russians had a sociopath. Oh, my God, it'd really throw off that equation. Or for the North Koreans. You yeah. Know, for instance, maybe a bunch of sociopaths. Um, yeah. I mean, the problem is that um, if you, I mean, human beings are only, I don't know, we can be rational, but we're not rational all the time. Maybe only 30% of the time, or I don't know, maybe our conscious minds are just creating rationalizations for what our, um, you know, lower urges and emotions and psychological needs, you know, get us to do. I, I uh, it, if you think that all people are rational, you should ask any neuroscientist, any psychologist, or any bartender, and they will tell you <laughs> human beings do crazy things. And, you know, that was that was one of my, my big revel. Actually, you know what? I, I um, when I was reading. Um, uh, so I, I have a degree in uh, international politics uh, from Edinburgh. Um, uh, wow. And, I, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm surprisingly well educated uh, for, uh, for, for a guy that makes uh, weird advertisements about uh, waterproof guitars and things. I've, I've, I've got a background in it. Um, and at the same no, time, I, I was, just I just want to I just want to mention that before you called, uh, we had a leak in the bathroom and a guy in a tuxedo came and fixed it. Nice. It made me feel it completely inadequate, though. From you know? formal plumbers? Oh, yeah. You got it. Uh, I, I don't know if you they, they do have a service where you can hire a, a naked plumber to come over. That is it's kind of another thing. But but uh, good. I'm delighted you're using our sponsors. Um, I, I was going to say that while, while getting my master's degree, uh, one of the one of the sort of unrelated things that I that I read that really resonated with me that I that I, th I think you're you're pointing to and you're you're correct about is that we like to think of human beings as rational. We're not. We're rationalizing. We tend to make an emotional yeah. decision and then we want to back it up. Uh, and I, yeah. I see this in, in uh, political media all the time, where uh, a lot of the time someone you know the, there's a, a huge impulse to support your team, whatever it's doing, and to kind of rush yeah. in and then. To, to sort of um, defense attorney, whatever you said, uh, in order to back it up. I think that's there. Um, with, mm -hmm. with, with mutually assured destruction, I, I look at it and I think that it, I think it has worked. However, it has been such incredibly, because the stakes are everybody dies. That's the, the, that's yeah. the stakes. It's not, right. like, it's not like a stock market crash or something. So there is something to it. Like we probably would have gone to war with Russia had it not been for, for nuclear weapons. I think there would have been a flashpoint if, if, if nuclear weapons never existed, we would have eventually gone to war in Berlin or some other place. So, so in that sense, World War III, I think, did get staved off. But World War III could have happened if uh, that the, you know, the, the, the third guy on, on the submarine had agreed that he should have launched right. the nuke if, uh, if, if the guy hadn't had it. Um, so out, out of curiosity, then, I'm going to pose a, a philosophical question to you, or, or, or a theoretical okay. question to you, rather. Um, if you could snap your fingers and get rid of all the nukes in America, but you couldn't get rid of anybody else's nukes, would you do it? No, okay. absolutely not. Okay. Nuclear weapons are not weapons. They're primarily symbols. They're kind of weapons some of the time. I feel like they're, the they're time, pretty big weapons. They're symbols. Well, but but as it, it, you know, William James would say, what's their practical impact on the world? Mm -hmm. uh, and their actual effect is mostly symbolic. We use them symbolically as deterrents. We don't actually fire them off. Part of the reason we're in this problem is that we haven't used nuclear weapons. You know, they invented machine guns in the 1860s, 1860s 70s, used them a little bit uh, at the end of the Civil War. Um, they were used in the Boer War. But when they sh but they didn't use them enough so that people really understood their capabilities. If 50 years later in World War One, after they'd been invented 50 years earlier, French generals were still saying, OK, guys, just charge the machine guns. Yeah. If you do it with enough elan, then it won't be a problem. And so it 
it takes human beings a lot of experience with weapons or tools or any kind of technology to really, you know, hone in on what it does well and what it doesn't do well. We're trying to figure out how to use nuclear weapons basically with one use. Yeah. Bomb, yeah. Bombing two cities. So... Uh, and and, and the know. second use is lights out, most likely. Uh, it would, you know, in, in, in the, uh, maybe we could have done it in Vietnam or something like that. But if there were an escalation with Russia or China today, uh, particularly Russia, that's it. We don't get we don't get a third try. Uh, right. Know, we, we, there, there's yeah. there's no there's no nuclear war with Russia. Part two. Um, Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I think nuclear deterrence works some of the time. OK. The, the problem is. You know, and maybe it deterred World War Three some of the time. Sure. OK. The problem is, if it's not perfect, then eventually it's going to fail because we're fallible human beings and we're involved in the process of nuclear deterrence. And so by definition, nuclear deterrence is a flawed process, which means, you know, unless we do something sensible, uh, we're just heading towards eventual nuclear war it seems to me yeah no i i, I think that that's a very good way of putting it D deterrence does work but it's not perfect and when it doesn't mm -hmm. work it's really 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 bad so <laughs> yeah. on that note then um you know there, there are uh there are causes for being optimistic um we uh the the nuclear non-proliferation treaty i think has been very successful in terms of doing its goal i mean we've, we've you know uh, it wasn't successful entirely in terms of north korea because north korea now has nukes could be that Iran steps up here in a couple of years, but um, you know, if you go back to like, gosh, I, th I think '89, as of 1989, South Africa still had nuclear power, uh, and it, and it, it, yeah. it, the only country in the world to ever have a nuclear bomb and get rid of it. And then you know, you had yeah. all of these other countries that, at the dawn of the atomic age, just assumed that we'd all have nukes. You know, I mean, countries like Switzerland, and uh, uh, you know, I think more famous examples are, are Libya and Egypt and a few others that had a nuclear program but then dismantled them. So there have been yeah. efforts to scale it down. Do you do you see places where that is a possibility now? Where I don't know, we do we do like a swap with Russia. We we each get rid of a nuke one at a time. Or what, what would a de-escalation look like? It seems to me that well, see, uh, I differ a little bit from. I think that we focus on nuclear weapons on the weapons too much that the, the disarmament process has all been kind of technical and military and and uh, the reason we have nuclear weapons is because they're really terrific symbols that um, they're the currency of power people countries think they're great powers when they have nuclear weapons mm -hmm. Kim Jong-un can't use his nuclear weapons very effectively and if he did he'd be wiped off the map yeah, he could he could knock but, out Guam and that's you know which would be terrible but not or not the or end of mankind. Japanese cities. Yeah. yeah, but but he wouldn't be able to do anything to us, particularly, or even if he could. Um, you know, Japan lost sixty eight cities in World War Two, and it, they didn't surrender till the Russians came into the war, and the Germans lost even more cities. So we would survive if one city were destroyed or two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, but I think that the the good news the good news is that the symbolic power of nuclear weapons seems to be on the decline. Uh, last In 2017, 122 countries voted in the UN to ban this treaty that prohibits nuclear weapons. It obviously doesn't have any impact because... Wait, I'm sorry, they, they voted to ban the treaty that prohibits nuclear weapons? No, I, they, they voted to prohibit nuclear weapons. Gotcha, okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> Get some canned food, guys. We're, we're in for a long winter. <laughs> and um, so, but which doesn't have any impact because the nine nuclear powers didn't sign and the uh, countries in Europe and uh, in Asia that are under nuclear umbrellas didn't sign. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a sign that in the world there's this shift where people are beginning to say, well, nuclear weapons, not a great thing. And they're right, of course, because... If we fought a nuclear war with Russia, even if we won, we'd be crippled. And what kind of war do you want to fight where after the war is over, China takes over? Mm. Or if we fought a war with China, then Russia would take over. Or if we fought a war with Russia and China, then Europe would take over. You know, you're just whatever happens after a nuclear war, you're going to be too devastated to have any impact on subsequent events. So, 
So there's this decline in the perceived value of nuclear weapons. And I think that's, that, that is the, the um, silver lining, is okay. that um, even though we've um, believed in them for so long, not really based on much evidence, there seems to be a kind of a shift going on in public opinion. Well, I'm not. I'm not willing to to let go of the very clear weapon uh, aspect of nuclear weapons. I do think that's a big part of it. I'm sure that there's a lot of, of thinking that goes into the military in terms of, you know, overwhelming uh, enemy anti uh, anti missile forces and that kind of thing with a sheer amount of, of missiles. So I, I imagine there's some strategy there. However, I, I do think you're right that there is a, a significant psychological and symbolic component to nuclear missiles. And I would think that if if that is the case, then the sheer number of them is less important than merely being in the club. Ergo, because yeah. I, I bet if you were to look at like the amount of missiles that say France has, I, I don't know, but I'm guessing it's it's nothing compared to the arsenal the United States or Russia has. Uh, and so well, once already in there, they don't necessarily have to scale up. You can see it in history. Khrushchev becomes much bolder and much more aggressive as soon as they have um, intercontinental ballistic missiles. And at, in the early days, they only have four. So it's not based on the actual military capability. It's clearly just based on his, I, his, it seems to me that looking at his actions, he's, um, he must've believed that once you have the weapon, then you're kind of in the club, you can act like a nuclear superpower and it doesn't actually, the military balance itself doesn't actually matter. So. Am I, am I right in thinking that we, we did have a period I'm assuming I, I think it was during George H.W. Bush and Gorbachev, but I could be wrong. But following the conclusion of the, the Soviet Union, didn't we have a period where we both reduced our stockpiles by some amount? Yeah. Well, um, Reagan and Gorbachev met at Reykjavik and agreed to begin negotiations. And those negotiations led to cutting the arsenals in half. Great. And good then, job, guys. Uh, yeah, they did good work. And so uh, and George H.W. Bush in, uh, I can't remember, 91, mm -hmm. 92, um, simply ordered that all the tactical nuclear weapons be withdrawn, except for a handful in Europe and a handful in a couple of other places, because it's not clear that they're that great military weapons. I mean, mil um, it's, a, it's a lot easier to find army generals who uh, don't like the weapons I, I, I know a guy who's a retired four-star um, army general. Uh, he was the commander in Korea. And I asked him once, what are nuclear weapons really good for? And he said, the only thing you can really do with them is to launch them into an area, create a lot of radiation, and effectively deny that area to your enemy so that you channel where his attack will come so you can force him to come through a narrower area where there's no radiation. And that's a pretty specific and not wide ranging. I mean, other, other than that, he felt they weren't that effective uh, on the battlefield. So I was impressed by that. Okay. Well, let's, let's do that because we'll, we, we'll, we've got about 10 minutes left and then we'll, we'll wrap up. We've, we've already worked our way through some of the myths in the book. We've gone through nuclear weapons. Keep us safe. Uh, everyone listening is now frightened. Uh, including the astronomy majors. <laughs> Yay! My uh, work yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. We're. Yeah. You and I are going to revive a uh, 1950s Twilight Zone era fear of the bomb. Um, we've got. I think we we've kind of talked about. We talked about mutually assured destruction. That that corresponds to chapter three of your book, Nuclear Deterrence Works in Crisis. Um, uh, there's there is no alternative. I guess we've kind of talked about that. Uh, but what what would you see as the alternative to it? Is is a realistic way of moving away from nuclear bombs? Would it would it be through non-proliferation treaties? Would it would it be just this the psychological shift? Well, see, here's the thing. Um, I think people say you can't disinvent nuclear weapons, and um, that's a really weird argument because disinvention is a process that doesn't exist. Um, I mean, saying that the world will always have nuclear weapons because they can't be disinvented is like saying I will always be alive because I can't be reverse born. Mm. Well, being reverse born doesn't exist. People go away by dying. They don't go away by being reverse born. And nuclear weapons don't go away by being disinvented. Te any kind of technology goes away when people realize that it is not useful. 
either it never was useful and they just come to realize it or circumstances change and for whatever reason every things are different now and so it's no, no longer useful and i think that the what what you have to do to get rid of nuclear weapons is you have to make it so that they're no longer the currency of power mm. and i don't know what that new currency would be snapchat i had to guess <laughs> it's gonna be social media <laughs> If I had to guess, I would say um, probably uh, drones of some kind or swarming uh, swarming drones or lo- lots of small weapons that can work together in concert. Or, or possibly um, uh, possibly computer attacks. I mean, it's one of those things where, um, you know, yeah. if, if we were to have an EMP and a, a nuclear weapon would create an EMP, um, that would knock out, you know, if, if, you, if you detonated a nuclear weapon, without even intending to destroy targets, you just detonated it over the sky between, say, New York City and D.C., um, that would mm-hmm. obliterate the, the grid there because it would punch a hole in the ozone so all of that radiation would come down and flood it and fry every circuit. If you did that two or three times across the United States, you'd have massive death, not from shock waves, but from, uh, but from starvation because logistically we wouldn't be able to, to coordinate it, like th- things like medicine. So I could see a situation where... Um, and this is a, a, a weird and perhaps another grim thing to contemplate. You could see a, a scenario where Iran or North Korea or Russia or whoever wouldn't have nuclear weapons, but they would potentially have the capacity to do computer terrorism and knock out the grid and th- thereby disable a country. Right. And, you know, we'd all sit around going, I, 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 I can't get on Facebook. Yeah. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. That would, yeah. yeah. It would, it, people, people would freak out. Um, I, I think in, t- in terms of disinventing nuclear weapons, I, I, I don't think it's realistic to get rid of them. I, I don't like I think that the point at which that will ever happen, we will be, you know, we'll be living in the Star Trek world, uh, the Star Trek days where, you know, we're, we're, we're all buddies because we're fighting the Klingons or whatever. Uh, but I would be very happy to scale it back to the point where it would not be global destruction if a war were to happen. I would think that that deterrent effect would remain would remain in effect if say like Russia and the United States both had 20 nuclear missiles. Um, if, 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 if they had that, that would still be sufficient to not really want to go to war with each other. But then also, like, if you're in Brazil, you're not going to die. Well, I think there's something to be said for that. I, I am more optimistic than you, I think. I, I don't imagine that nuclear weapons will go away when people all become brothers and they like each other. I think we'll always, you know, hate each other mm. and... and They'll always be bad actors, and we'll always have to be France. Have, have armed forces and be be cautious. Mm-hmm. But over time, you know, weapon systems come into vogue, and then they go out of vogue. For a long time, chariots were the big thing, and uh, everyone wanted every king wanted to have all of his guys in chariots until they discovered that they're terrible weapons. You um, you can't drive fast at all because they have no shock absorbers. So the slightest, you hit a rock that's five or six inches tall and you're liable to throw the guy out of the chariot. You can't use spears with them because you spear a guy who weighs more than you do. And instead of you driving the spear through him, it just drives you out the back of the chariot. So, and you can't use a sword because the horses are so wide, they'll already trample people and you can't reach them. So you have to use you know, use them as platforms for bow and arrow, which they eventually did. But, you know, the Romans, who were the most pragmatic warriors, uh, made a judgment about how useful chariots were, and they assigned them one key role, which was carrying emperors in parades. Mm. But other than that, they never used them militarily because, and I think when that kind of uh, psychological evolution happens with nuclear weapons, then it'll be relatively easy to get rid of them because people will say they're obsolete weapons. They're weapons of the past. I'd much rather use my swarming drones or my <laughs> hypersonic missiles Flying or robots. whatever. Well, yeah, yeah. so let's, 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 let's dig in. Let's finish on that note then. Let's dig into that because that, that's something that I'm, I still haven't quite wrapped my mind around yet. When, when, I, when I think of nuclear weapons, I think of them as being bad, not because they're ineffective, but because they're far too effective because they, they, you know, they're, they're apocalyptic. Um, so that's that's the principal concern I have with them. Uh, but it, it sounds like you're, you're establishing that that is true. However, you're saying on a tactical level, they are they are what? They're too blunt. They're too clumsy. Uh, if, if you yeah. were if you were trying to talk generals out of using them, um, what would you say? Because I would look at it and go, it's clearly a very big bomb. And so in that regard, it strikes well, me as very useful. 
I don't have to talk generals out of using them because they've already been withdrawn from tactical service. I mean, most generals, I assume, would share the opinion of this four-star general that I was talking to. That okay. They're, they're not that effective. But here's the thing. Let's say you've got a nuclear battlefield. Let's say you're using nukes on the battlefield. Two things. One, when our troops are next to their troops, that's a problem because – you drop a bomb on their troops, the wind blows the wrong way or it shifts around. Mm -hmm. Then the radiation blows back on our troops and you can kill a bunch of our guys. So you don't really want to do that. Anytime you have a nuclear battlefield, you've got to either, you've got two choices. You can institute cumbersome decontamination procedures and protection procedures. Guys are wearing big suits, big like look like the Michelin man. And they can't see because they're breathing through this, you know. And and so you've either got to do that and let military operations grind to a standstill while you wipe and clean, or you got to be willing to lose some of your own guys. Hmm. And military generals are pretty loyal to their troops. They don't want to use weapons that force them to kill some of our troops. So I think the case against nuclear weapons on the battlefield is pretty clear, and you don't have to take my word for it because there are a bunch of generals who've said they're not useful for anything except deterrence, mm -hmm. which I think is true. Gotcha. They're okay. Not, right. And the, but I but I don't want to use them for deterrence because I don't trust people not to be idiots. Yeah. No, okay. Man. Okay. That that makes sense to me now. Too. I I see what you're saying. Right. So so there there is a deterrent element to them, but in terms of just Work-a-day, um, run-of-the-mill warfare, they're actually not very useful uh, on a tactical yeah. level, which which makes sense. Yeah. We, we don't have, like, at one point, I remember reading like Eisenhower, who I think is an interesting guy with nukes, because he, he did threaten people with him. Uh, we, yeah. you know, ta Taiwan, we actually, Taiwan nearly got us into a couple of wars with China because they wanted us yeah. to invade. And, uh, yeah. and Eisenhower, at least initially, sort of, he sort of foresaw, like, like troops digging trenches and having you know, like arm, like, like rocket launchers that would fire tiny nukes and things. And, and then eventually got talked out of it because that was not going to work. But he just saw it as the next step in conventional warfare and presumably abandoned it for the reasons that you're discussing. Yeah. Well, they, it, Ike in, uh, in Korea, uh, Ike becomes president and he says, okay, I want to look at nu using nukes in Korea. Cause I don't want to build up a taboo around these weapons. If we're going to have them, we're going to use them and you know, they're real. And so we'll, Let's get to biz get to work. And so the National Security Council, um, the actual study that they that the military did is still classified, but the National Security Council discussion is available. And what they concluded is that um, Korea is such a it's cut by a lot of sharp ravines. And you could nuke a Chinese regiment in this ravine, and the one in the next ravine would be fine because the blast would all go up in the air mm. and the problem with the wind blowing and right. so on. And so you'd have to use a lot of nuclear weapons to try and win the war tactically with nuclear weapons. And even then, you might not. And their concern was that if they used the weapons, they used 30 weapons, and it didn't win the war – that it would devalue nuclear weapons as deterrence. Hmm. Okay. The only really good targets they could find were airports, which are large, flat, open spaces, so you can really show the impact of the bomb. Hmm. But they didn't want to use them there. So they eventually decided they weren't going to use nuclear weapons, even though I was pretty gung-ho uh, in Korea. Well, I'm, I'm glad that that became the case. Uh, because I, I do not think the world would be better for conventional nuclear weapons, uh, e even if they yeah. proved to be not that effective. I think it would. There, there, I, I could imagine some unforeseen consequences that might occur yeah. if, we, if we had dropped some bombs on Korea and later Vietnam and you know I don't know the Persian yeah. Gulf or whatever we were going to yeah. do. Uh, well, yeah, Ward I Wilson, I have I have enjoyed speaking to you tremendously. I heard a rumor that you're working on a new book. Is that true? Yes, uh, I'm. I, I finished the manuscript. It's tentatively titled Hope in the Nuclear Age, The Realist Case for Eliminating Nuclear Weapons. Nice. Okay. Well, uh, I, I wish you the best of luck with the book. Please, please reach out when you've, when you've got it out there. Thank you very much. It's really fun to be on. I, why is it that so many smart guys who are comedians do podcasts. Can you explain <laughs> that? I, what, um, you know what? Yeah, I'll just, before we, before we go off, I'll kind of tell you. Um, I think partly, I think that podcasts are the new vaudeville. 
Um, there was there was this kind of weird this and for the the, the audience listening now we've completely there's nothing to do with nukes we're completely departing from the, the topic <laughs> du jour a hundred percent we're just going to indulge me for a moment um, you know there there was a period where I think um, if you were a funny guy you would get your stick and bindle and you you'd hop a train car and you'd just go from town to town and you'd do vaudeville uh, George Burns mm -hmm. like you know had uh, George Burns is like his his fiftieth name because he was so terrible when he started out he'd have to st he'd have to change names every every time he went back to a town and so that mm -hmm. went on there were a lot of worst belt comedians and then um, you have kind of a boom in the eighties where you get all these you know every town had like three to five stand up comedy clubs uh, and you could you could make pretty good living at that time like I, I talked to older comedians when I moved to New York and guys that are now like in their I guess they're in their sixties or so or in their fifties when they were um, uh, doing stand up. They're like, yeah, you know, I was doing stand up in the East Village and I, you know, I, I just live off of doing open mics. And I was like, that today is not wow. how the market works. Uh, you can't. Right. The, I mean, no, no one in, in New York, literally right now, if you want to do an open mic, you have to pay them because the stage time is so precious that you wow. have to pay the person running it. Uh, and so that kind of it can, and, and then Comedy Central comes around um, and the amount of people watching comedy declines because now you can go home and just you know eat a pizza with your girlfriend and watch it on TV. You don't have to go to a comedy club. So there's this right. boom and bust in the comedy world. I think what you're seeing right now is you're, you're seeing um, that there is this demand for comedians again on, on a mass level that we hadn't quite realized that wasn't necessarily open. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, while you know I, I'm, I'm here at The Blaze and I'm part of a network and, and uh, I was recruited and everything, um, there, there are other people who you don't have to go through a gatekeeper anymore. You can just, if you've, if you've got a good product, you're a clever person that, that has something funny and something to contribute, you can just jump on and do it. And so for that reason, I, I think it's kind of a, a, a boom right now where everybody's jumping in. Hmm. That's really interesting. And, and that concludes our episode on the economics of stand-up comedy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been really great to talk to you and i appreciate i'm you know thank you for uh reading the book and giving it a little plug i appreciate that a lot and uh you know there aren't a lot of people i spent years and years uh working on nuclear weapons and i there have been so many parties that i went to where i would go up to someone and they would say what do you do and i'd say well i work as a computer consultant but what i'm really interested in is <laughs> nuclear weapons and let me tell you something about deterrence and they would always glance down at their glass and then point to it and say you know I'm just going to get this refilled. <laughs> I'll be right back. You wait right here. <laughs> so, I no, I think what you need to do is just lean in and get really conspiratorial and go, have you ever seen Dr. Strangelove? Because then you can just talk about that film. So anyway, well, uh, that's what I Ward, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Guys, wasn't that the most delightful conversation about the nuclear apocalypse you've ever heard in your entire life? I can't fathom having a more jolly conversation about nuclear war. That was, it was, uh, I'm surprised by how, how much fun and, and light that conversation was. A little bit of listener feedback before we conclude today's program. On YouTube, Michael Sterling says, I love this podcast. May the grace of Captain Planet be with you and with you. Hey, did you guys know we sell merch? That's right. If you go to shop.theblaze.com, you can get t-shirts for all of our sponsors, or at least many of them. Jillian's Rooster Removal, Nick's Horseless Diner, Uncle Milton's Caffeinated Crab Dip, Bigfoot for Congress, and of course, my favorite, Snuffy's off Route 44, a diner where all of the meals are ordered from and served by waiters and waitresses on horses. I'm pretty sure if you buy one of these t-shirts that I don't get a cut of the profits, so I'm just doing this for your benefit. But if you tweet me a picture of you in it, it will absolutely make my day. I say that. I say that. I We thought it would be funny uh, a couple of days ago to ask you to send pictures of yourself either wearing one of these shirts that we sell or not wearing a shirt at all. I had sort of anticipated some nubile groupies sending me pics. And instead, I got a lot of bearded middle-aged guys sending me these topless pictures of themselves with a thumbs up. And yesterday, I asked you guys to quit doing that. From what I can tell... You guys started going out and ripping shirts off of other bearded middle-aged guys who are clearly unaware of this joke that we're participating in and then sending me pictures of these terrified half-naked men. Please stop doing that. Just buy our t-shirts. They're fun. They're, you're supporting the program. Do not send me topless pics of you or men you've tackled in a Walmart parking lot. I don't want them. Where was I? Okay, you can watch this whole show on YouTube. If you look for Something's Off with Andrew Heaton, you can see my handsome bearded face, assortment of suits, and the dead buffalo head we screwed to the wall. Watching Something's Off with 
Andrew Heaton on your computer or phone is sure to be a highlight of your day. I know watching it on your phone over your shoulder is the best part of my day. So go to YouTube and start watching full episodes. I look like I probably have a pet turtle hanging around somewhere. Remember, you can always tweet me at Mighty Heaton or Facebook me at Facebook.com slash Mighty Heaton or even email me by subscribing to my newsletter at MightyHeaton.com, just replying when I send it out on Fridays, when I remember to send it out on Fridays. Finally, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. That helps other people discover this here political orphanage. Thank you for listening, and thank you, astronomy majors. Good day.